My guest today is Mike Robertson, one of the most highly sought after coaches, consultants, speakers, and writers in the fitness industry. Known for his no nonsense approach to training and brutal efficiency, Mike has made a name for himself as a go to resource for professional athletes from every major sport. Mike is the president of the Robertson Training Systems and the co owner of Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training. IFAST has been named one of the top 10 gyms in America by Men's Health Magazine three times in the last six years. Mike, really appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, man. I'm excited to be here. Terrific. Well, before we kind of dive into talking training and physical preparation, can you maybe give listeners a quick uh, whirlwind tour of your background and the journey to where you're at today? Yeah, yeah. I'll do, uh, I'll do my best to give it the short version versus the long, but perfect. Uh, grow, growing up, young kid, always loved sports. Uh, grew up in the country, like the nearest kid my age was like miles down the road. So I got really good at, at entertaining myself and, you know, whether it was kicking a soccer ball around, hitting tennis balls against a barn door or just going outside and getting buckets. Like I just found ways to entertain myself with sports and really fell in love with basketball. You know, everything they say and joke about Indiana is true. Like we're obsessed with, with the sport of basketball here. And I was no different. I love playing basketball. And it really wasn't until in between my sophomore and junior years of high school that our weight room or that, that our high school even got a weight room. So I went to a really small high school, like 47 kids. And wow. I quickly realized that this is just another way that I can make myself a better basketball player. So absolutely loved the weight room, loved going in there, getting bigger, stronger, more athletic. Um, unfortunately for me, basketball at the next level just wasn't in the cards. So, you know, decided this, I, I knew I wanted to do something with fitness and with sports and spent four years of my undergrad, basically messing around, trying to figure out how that was going to work. And it wasn't until I got an internship at the end of my senior year where I got to work in the Ball State University athletic weight room with the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team that I realized this is what I want to do. So basically dove in there head first. I was a, a graduate assistant in the research lab. I was volunteering time in the strength and conditioning room, you know, spent two and a half years there, three years doing rehab, three years doing in-home personal training. And then in 2008, Bill Hartman and I basically decided, uh, we love training. We're both working for other people. We feel like we're good enough. If we open a gym that we would be successful. So that's kind of the long and short of it. 10 years later, here we are. I've been training people for like 18 years now, and still every bit as passionate about helping my clients and athletes now as I was way back in 2000 when I got started. That's fantastic. And to dovetail off that a little bit, you know, a lot of young coaches love to talk about, you know, exercises, new exercises, loading progressions, you know, focusing on formats rather than sort of physiology or philosophy. So maybe yep. we could start off by perhaps you can walk listeners through your model, you know, position, pattern, load, express for increasing athleticism and performance. Yeah. So, you know, I was one of those guys where I grew up, first off, I, I grew up as a power lifter, you know? So once I got into the strength and conditioning side, it just made sense to me that if I'm going to teach these huge freaking football players that are squatting five and 600 pounds, how to be better at squatting, I should probably be at least average at squatting. So to do that, I became a powerlifter and basically spent five, six years of my life competing in the sport of powerlifting. And if you know anything about the sport, it's very technically driven, but at the same time, it's all about putting weight on the bar. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's putting weight on the, the bar at the expense of movement quality. Even though you're trying to keep it as high as you can, things inevitably go wrong when you're training at 90, 95, or 100 percent of your one rep max. For sure. So for me, especially when I started focusing my training on athletes, my main goal was to make them as efficient as possible. Now, most people would pigeonhole that and say, we don't train hard. That's not true. But I think of it as you have to earn your way into training hard or to using more load. So for me, those four steps, position is quite simply, you know, can you get your body into the positions you need to to be successful? to squat, to deadlift, to lunge, to push up, right? Because if you can't do that, then it really doesn't make sense to put a ton of weight on the bar or to make you run endless amounts of conditioning exercises because you're not going to do it well, right? You're building, 
you know, this huge engine on a very poor foundation. So position is always first for me. From there, it's pattern. And and patterning is, you know, you got to learn how to squat the right way again before you load up that bar. So this is where like progressions and regressions come into play. You have to build the proper squat pattern. You have to build the proper hinge pattern, push up, lunge. Again, building those patterns out before step three where you move into loading. And this is where, you know, most people are they're, they're like, oh, OK, so he does load, you know. But again, you kind of have to earn that right to start loading the bar and to start pushing weight if you're going to train with me. So, you know, you got to learn how to load because there's so many good benefits from simply loading the body, whether it's more strength, whether it's more power, whether it's you know, more speed. You know, there's so many good things, injury resistance. There's so many good things from simply progressively overloading the body. But I don't think it's the last piece in the puzzle. Again, if you're an athlete, it's all about expression. And that's the power element. That's the speed or the time constraint that we all deal with in sports. So this is where, unfortunately, a lot of strength training programs go wrong when it's implied to athletes. It's you get to a point where you've kind of exceeded what you need from the strength realm, but you keep dipping into the strength bucket. So now you're almost training like a power lifter where the bar speeds are really slow. You're not getting the same stretch, and stretch shortening cycle effect. And now you're starting to lose power production. Or, you know, you're, you can still jump high, but it takes you forever to do it. Okay. So For that's sure. where the expression part comes in. It's, hey, man, I want you to be big and fast and strong and athletic. But again, you have to be able to work within the time constraints of your sport. So those are kind of the four levels that I take everybody through. And, you know, depending on where you're at when you show up, depending on where you're at in your career, you're probably going to fall somewhere differently into that continuum. But that's kind of the four step process that I'm always kind of coming back to with regards to my model and my setup for training athletes. Yeah, that's terrific. And, uh, you know, years ago when I was working in strength and conditioning and I worked with a lot of basketball players and so, you know, movement dysfunction, oftentimes significant movement dysfunction was sort of part and parcel. Yep. Um, you know, so how do you build some physical qualities when movement qualities are off in some of these athletes? Yeah, you know, and that's such a great question. I just actually had this discussion with um, this young man who's a PT student with Bill Hartman right now. And he said, you know, like, what are some of the tougher situ- situations you've been in? And I mean, this is like the worst case scenario when, say, somebody has a time constraint in the fact that they have to be ready for camp in six weeks, right? But when they show up on my doorstep, they're an absolute train wreck, (laughs) you know, from from a movement quality perspective. So this is where I think it really comes down to the art of coaching. You have to figure out, okay, what exercises can I do that are still going to prepare them for the forces they're going to see them in their, in their sport, for the velocities, for the movement demands, while at the same time building them some modicum of movement reserve, right? So a lot of times we see guys and they come in and let's say a football player comes in and he's got zero degrees of hip internal rotation or negative five degrees. You know, you may not need 40 but you need more than zero. Like you can't even get in a stance or you can't even get in and out of a cut. So, you know, in this case, to try and get some of those movement characteristics or or train some of those physical qualities, you have to find things that maybe aren't as contextual to them. So here's what I mean by that. A lot of the the guys that I, I train that are very stiff and they're very rigid, they tend to be very patterned when it comes to symmetrical bilateral lifts like say a squat or a trap bar deadlift. So if I put them in those positions, they're only going to go back to their old posture or position. So what I have to do is I kind of have to reframe what they think of as challenging. So a uh, great example, a couple of years ago, I had uh, an NFL tight end came in kind of this same situation, like not a ton of hip rotation. If I put a bar on his back, he would just really arch his back hard, throw his pelvis forward and ultimately couldn't squat the way that I needed him to. So instead of just continuing to try and back squat him, I said, okay, let's just change the rules of the game. So we moved to a heavy two kettlebell front squat. And all of a sudden, now this guy doesn't have a context for what heavy is, right? Like for sure. if, if it's a back squat, something he's familiar with, he knows, oh, if I'm not squatting 405, I'm not, I'm not pushing enough weight. Versus here, he just knows, oh, crap, this is like heavy. Even though it's only like, say, two thirty-two kilo kettlebells, oh my gosh, 
I feel my abs. I feel my quads. I'm squatting deeper than I ever have before. And my hips don't hurt. Right. So I think that's one of the big things is trying to find ways to number one, shift context. And then number two, being creative. Like nobody said that if you want to be a great athlete, you have to barbell back squat. So you can two kettlebell front squat. Maybe they can't do that. Hey, can you push a prowler that's heavy and, and work on driving and work on hip separation and extending your hips? Can you drag a heavy sled? Can you do hill sprints? You know, there's so many ways if you get out of the mold of just thinking about what can I do in a weight room? And you kind of put that constraint off yourself and you say, what can I do to just build a better athlete based on what I have in front of me? Then all of a sudden you're forced to be a little bit more creative. And I think that's where you can really see some cool changes, even even though you're not using maybe some of the exercises that you or they are most familiar with. Yeah, very well said. I mean, still too often you see some people trying to sort of pound the square peg into the round hole with, you know, yep. forcing those patterns. So great, uh, great advice there. Great tips on how to sort of work around that and be creative. So important. And, um, you know, continuing on this tale, sort of basketball preseason, you'd, you'd recently written in one of your blogs um, around being at a recent pro day, a combine and, and shocked really at how many of those amazing athletes didn't really understand movement angles can you talk yes. a little bit more about the importance of linear and lateral acceleration and deceleration? Yeah, I mean, well, first off, if you play sports, acceleration in a lot of ways is the name of the game. Like I think 100%. top end speed, pe people are enamored with it and rightfully so because those people have just phenomenal nervous systems. But so much of sports happens in a very small box, right? So like in, in the world of basketball, it's a lot of times you're in like a five or 10 square foot space. You know, can you create separation? Can you can you close down passing lanes or shooting, you know, angles, positions, whatever? So this is something that with my athletes I'm constantly coaching is can you find the best angle to push from to accelerate fluidly or can you find the best angle to stop from? And, and again, as Lee Taft always says, it's not just about deceleration. It's about then reaccelerating. But I think there's a couple things that I see either number one, people are only taught to decelerate, right? Which isn't probably the best thing because the positions and the angles you get into are totally different when your only goal is to decelerate versus to decelerate and then reaccelerate and come back out of a cut. Gotcha. Right. So that's, that's one issue that I see. But the other issue that I see is, Again, people just don't understand like the concept of like the line of push, right? So people may understand it intuitively going straight ahead because I feel like linear acceleration has been beat up pretty good. But when it comes to like lateral acceleration, it, when we're talking about a basketball player, you know, you, you kind of want a little bit wider base. So you're nice and stable. So you can be able to plant and move in any particular direction. You can get that nice push through the whole foot and, and Again, using a Lee, a Lee Taft term, you know, kind of driving that lateral gait cycle yep. is so important. And, and I just find a lot of these guys, they don't understand it, but the guys that I've worked with are generally higher level. So, you know, either just a simple cue from me or maybe putting a band on them, which forces them to lower their center of gravity, widen their base of support a little bit. Then all of a sudden it's like now they're in the right position and then they can naturally push the way that I want them to. So it's one of those things where it's an element of literally every training day that I do. And again, keep in, keep in mind, my world is a little bit different because it's kind of clean and tidy. If a guy's training for like a pro day or training to get into a training camp, he's generally pretty dedicated. So we can have a Absolutely. theme each day. Monday can be lateral acceleration. Wednesday can be linear. Friday can be change of direction. So that makes it easy. You know, like some of you that are listening, I guarantee you're like, the guys that run our athletic development classes at IFAS, it's kind of like a hodgepodge mix. You're trying to do a little bit of everything every day because you don't know how often the kids are going to come in, what days are they going to show up. You know, So it's a little bit harder when you're in that environment. But in my world, like literally every day, 15 to 20 minutes up front, as soon as we warmed up, as soon as we're ready, we're going to train on I – don't, I don't just think of it as movement quality, but movement skill – that's contextual to their sport. And to me, there's nothing more important than being able to accelerate and decelerate your body in all those various planes that you'll be in in your sport. Yeah, it's terrific. And if we keep on this discussion of younger athletes, 
you know, I've uh, seen it myself in the past, and I've heard you comment as well around you know the subpar and sometimes downright poor conditioning programs out there in you know, <laughs> yeah. the high school collegiate level, sort of a lack yeah. of a systematic approach. So, can you maybe speak to some of the gaps uh, out there and and perhaps share some fundamentals for writing a sound conditioning program? Man, this is such a loaded topic, <laughs> you know. But 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 like, I'll, I'll give you a great example of what really got me interested in conditioning is. One of my favorite soccer players was a high school girl that I worked with. Her name was K-Dog. And we were getting ready for her collegiate conditioning test, right? So this isn't just like some random high school. This is a major Division One program. And the conditioning test is a repeat 120 test. So not just the length of the football field. It's the length of the football field plus the end zones. And she's got to be able to run down in 18 seconds, which is a really good clip jog back in 35 seconds she had a 15 second break and she had to repeat that basically eight to ten times wow i mean now first off just the conditioning alone i mean that's just a monster test but now tell me how many times in a soccer game do you watch a kid run repeat 120 meter sprints or 120 yards doesn't matter it's still an ungodly amount it just doesn't happen never yet so this is like this is the issue that I have with these tests. So kind of the way I always have described this or my philosophy on this is, look, the test is what it is. And unless you have just an incredibly open-minded coach that wants to hear your input, that cares about what you have to say, that values your opinion, you're probably not going to change the conditioning test. So that's fine, but it's not going to necessarily dictate how I condition my athlete either. Okay, so I'm always thinking, you know, building that big aerobic base up front while at the same time working the opposite end of the end of the spectrum, doing some of that powerful alactic stuff. Right. And then over the course of that, that off season, building up that pyramid to where, look, they're going to be able to play their sport at a very high level. They're going to be well enough conditioned to where they can go and pass a conditioning test. But I'll be frank, like I don't I don't want or need the kid that wins the conditioning test. You know, I don't I don't need that because chances are the kid that wins that conditioning test isn't the most prepared to go out on the pitch and play a high level soccer game. So the way I always describe it to my athletes is this. I want you to show up. I want you to do respectively well at the conditioning test. But the goal isn't to be the best at the conditioning test. The the goal is to be the best conditioned soccer player you can be when you show up to camp and keep in mind that that's also a little bit different to when we're talking about say a high school kid or a college kid where maybe I will push them a little bit more in the off season and get them a little bit closer to what I would consider to be their peak fitness level because their season's so much shorter versus say one of my guys in the MLS, they may only have an eight to 10 week off season. So my only goal for them would be, Hey, I want you to show up fit enough to pass the fitness test, not be like the last guy. But I don't need you so fit that you're just like the fittest guy out there because inevitably what happens with that season is if you're the fittest guy in March, you're probably going to be smashed by the time July comes around. So it's like I want you you fit enough to get through preseason without getting injured. And and the preseason is basically two segments. It's like – three weeks of, you know, doing stuff with your team and then three, three weeks of like preseason level games. It's like, Hey, each stage builds on the next, but if you're the fittest guy in January, February, March, chances are by the time June and July comes around, you've already peaked. You're going down at that point. So it's a little bit different based on the context and and the level of the athlete. But yeah, for me winning the conditioning test, I mean, it sounds cool and it gives you something to beat your chest about, but you know, in a lot of cases, that doesn't mean you're the most prepared to go out and play well at your sport. Yeah, it's great. To, uh, great thoughts there and advice. Definitely thinking big picture in terms of being able to actually, you know, play and excel at your sport versus just being the, the fittest person and winning that fitness test. And, right. you know, if we shift gears now into talking in season training, you know, we're into NFL, college, high school football, but, you know, just from a in season training, regardless of sport, how do things change from an SNC coach's perspective? You know, once an athlete gets in season. Yeah. So, again, it kind of depends on the sport, and, and I love sports personally that have some sort of weekly rhythm. 
like football is great because you generally know you're going to play on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, soccer, for the most part, if you've got a normal season, normal rhythm, you're going to play every Saturday or Sunday. So there's a rhythm which allows you as a physical preparation coach to find a rhythm as well, right? And that that alone makes such a huge impact versus a sport like basketball, which can be a lot more hectic and you're playing on a Saturday and then a Tuesday and then a Friday or a Saturday. It's a little bit more all over the board. But for me, the big rocks are number one, quality and intensity have to stay relatively high, right? Now, that that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But I think keeping quality and intensity fairly high is definitely key. But if you're going to do that, also know and understand that volume has to drop, right? And, and this is where I think a lot of younger, maybe S&C or physical prep coaches go wrong. You have to be willing to understand, like, you are not the show at this, this point in time. You are not. You are a supplement to the athlete and to the coach. So in that case, your only job is to keep them healthy and to keep them performing at the highest level throughout the course of the season. So intensity stays high, volume drop to a degree. And then I'm just basically thinking of three different types of workouts. And I probably haven't, haven't worded it like this before, but I think most people will understand where I'm going with this. There's the 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 workout that is say a day or two after a match they're pretty well recovered and you maybe have four or five days out that's probably going to be the day that i'm going to push things the most right maybe we're going to get like a a a heavy ish squat or deadlift variation in we're going to push some weight you know on some of our upper body lifts we're going to push things a little bit right then there's the one where you're maybe a day or two out so this i think of more as like a facilitation type workout and this is where we're going to have lower eccentric stress or, or more exercises that are focused on the concentric. Maybe we're going to freshen up the legs, regain that lower body mobility, maybe push a little bit of weight with the upper body, but really just trying to freshen them up and make sure that they're fit and ready for the match. Gotcha. And then the third would just be like a pure like recovery flushing type workout. And that could be used almost any time during the week with the main goal being, hey, Look, I just want this athlete to restore the mobility, especially like with, you know, say football, basketball, soccer, these lower body dominant sports. I want to get the movement movement capacity back through the ankles, knees, hips, you know, just kind of flush everything out, get them feeling really good. And the goal of that workout, I mean, it may only be 15, 20 minutes, but the goal is they feel measurably better walking out versus when they walked in. So that's kind of how I think about it in season is those different styles and types of workouts. Again, you kind of plug and play based on the sport that you're working with, yep. you know, the, the competitive calendar. But, you know, those three styles of workouts, I feel like work pretty darn well. You just figure out where to plug it and play it based on your sport and the time of the year. That's great, Mike. And it, it dovetails into my next question here. And, and maybe you've answered it a little bit. But when we if we think about baseball now, you know, postseason um, you have teams heading into the playoffs after a long, a long year, um, and obviously into a compressed schedule, so playing more games in a shorter time span. So, so where's the focus now? Where's the uh, thinking in terms of, from an S and C perspective, of supporting these athletes? Is it is it more on the therapy staff and the nutritionists, or what's the role there for the for the training staff? Yeah. So when it comes to this time of year, and. And don't get it wrong, like you're always focused on performance in season, right? Especially at the professional level, everybody will tell you it's about wins and losses. So you, you got to be able to put your best team on the field as often as possible. Now, at this point in the, the season, it's like, OK, all hands on deck with regards to recovery and just facilitating that freshness, for lack of a better term. So, you know, if they come in the gym, even if we were doing, say, three sets, in season, we may only do two sets, and this may actually look like a like a real life taper, if you will. So instead of say training with 80, 75, 80, 85 percent in season to try and keep the intensity up relatively, I may drop that down to 65, 70 percent, or I may just do stuff that's really like bouncy and light. So instead of say doing even a box jump, maybe I'm doing like a band assisted jump or something like that that just kind of allows the nervous system to feel fast, to feel explosive, to make them feel fresh. Because you know as well as I do, like there's the physiological side, 
But then there's also the psychological side. Definitely. So if a guy feels bouncy or fast or strong, you know, like it or not, he's probably going to go out and play at a little bit higher level than if he didn't feel that way. So, you know, I don't think it's it's anything super special at that point in time. Again, you're really just trying to hang on from, you know, when you think about competitive basketball, baseball, soccer, these incredibly long in seasons from about five or six months in, you're really just tying the rope and trying to hold on to whatever you can anyways. So, you know, if I can get them to feel as fresh and as powerful and as strong as possible going into that postseason and just maintain that for as long as possible, then I feel like I've done my job as a physical prep coach. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I imagine that's where that individualization and that sort of art of the practice comes into play with just kind of really being able to put your finger on what uh, different players need to sort of feel that freshness and that balance, as you mentioned, right? Yeah, and so many of them just will tell you what they need, right? Like if you've got a good relationship with somebody, if you've gone through a whole season, like even the guys that you don't have the best relationship with, you have some. And so I remember years ago, uh, I was working with the Indy 11 and I mean, there was one or two guys literally just all year. I'm doing whatever I can to crack the code with them and, and get them to open up a little bit. And it wasn't until like the last game of the season, one of these guys comes up and he's like, hey, man, like my back is just killing me. What can you do? So, you know, we went through some targeted breathing exercises. I gave him some specific stretches and core training exercises he could do. He walked out. He felt better. So it's like if you have those those open lines of communication, a lot of times by that point in the year, the athletes will kind of tell you, look, coach, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I need. And then that's where you're absolutely right. It's the art of coaching. Okay, what does this guy need? What do I have in the toolbox? And what can we do both physiologically and psychologically to get him prepared to play at a high level? Yeah, 100%. Um, That's that's great stuff. And, you know, Mike, if we zoom back out here for a minute to sort of that 30,000 foot view, you know, yep. you talk about how you coach athletes, right? Not not soccer players, not football players, not basketball players, but but athletes. So, can you talk about how that influences you know your uh, writing training writing program? Yeah, and this is especially true. I mean, you got to think the younger the athlete, the more applicable this is. So, if you're getting somebody at 11, 12, 13, honestly, I don't care what sport little Johnny or little Janie plays like I just want to teach them to move better to be a better athlete overall because I know that'll carry over to whatever sport they end up playing but you know especially early on I'm I'm always thinking about I want to build those basic movement patterns right like squatting pushing up lunging hinging um, vertical pulling Those things are all skills that everybody needs. So, you know, if you kind of zoom out and you look at just movement as a whole, okay, those are the things that are always going to be inclusive in a program. So, like, I don't feel like the strength training side changes a ton from sport to sport. Now, obviously, there are specific needs and demands, right? So, like, soccer, hamstring pulls are notorious. So, you're always going to have elements of a hamstring injury prevention program in your soccer program. When it comes to baseball, there's obviously massive rotary demands. So you're going to see that influence. But I think too often we get caught up in arguing about like these minute details when if you put 100 programs out on a table from well-respected coaches from baseball, soccer, hockey, basketball, football, lacrosse, rugby, and you looked at 80% of the stuff in there, it would be incredibly similar, right? Like they're going to squat. They're going to probably do some form of a bench press or a deadlift like the the progression or regression or variation you choose that's fine but those big rocks are still in place the rest of it is just like the details and that's what people love to get caught up in arguing about so I think my point there was like don't get so caught up in the minutia there is a time and a place for that but if we zoom out and we just kind of realize look so So many of us need to just focus on the fact that we're all training athletes. There's certain patterns that I think are important regardless of sport because they will carry over to a myriad of different movement patterns. So that's kind of what I was trying to get across there. Like, again, people on the Internet love to find stuff to argue about. But I think, you know, movement skills, things that we teach in the weight room are are pretty universally impactful. It just comes down to some of the nitty gritty details and preferences that each coach may have. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how if you're 
you know, excellent at the fundamentals. It's amazing how, how far that can take most people. Yeah. And then the rest is that, yeah, that five, 10% after that. And, um, if we shift gears here a little bit, Mike, and talk more on the general population, um, you know, you recently did a podcast, which I thought was fantastic. 40 thoughts on turning 40. Um, I think we're the same vintage here. I turned 40 early this year. So definitely nice. appreciated the podcast. Encourage everyone <laughs> to check it out. Um, but I'm going to throw a couple areas that you touched on out at you. So maybe you could explain and enlighten just kind of a rapid fire here. Um, yeah. The first one was train appropriate for your age. Yeah, I think this is something that especially males probably struggle with. You know, especially the, the worst case scenario for me as a gen pop client that comes into my gym is the guy that was like crazy strong when he was like in his late teens or early 20s, because now that is his gold standard, right? He's like, well, I know I squatted 400 pounds or I deadlifted 500 pounds. So in the back of his mind, like that is always the goal or like the gold standard. So the way I describe this is, look, like when you're 40, you probably shouldn't train like you were 30 and you definitely shouldn't train like you were 20, right? The biggest thing, and Bill Hartman and I have talked about this numerous times, you know, cause he's turned 50, I've turned 40 is like recovery is the quite simply the biggest issue. Like you just can't recover as well at 40 as you can at 30 or as you could at 20. So you have to be cognizant of that and you have to make adjustments. Maybe that's decreasing your intensity. Right. So maybe only go hard twice a week. Maybe that means decreasing your frequency. So instead of training four days a week, you go to three days. You know, there's so many different ways that you can play around with this, but you have to figure out a rhythm and a format that works for you. Because what you shouldn't feel and what so many of my clients do feel like, at least when they come in, is, well, I just feel smashed all the time. And if that's the case, like you're just adding stress with your training on top of more stress, <laughs> you know, your body is, is just fighting to adapt and to recover and you're not allowing it to. So I think sometimes when you just give them that new frame of reference that, you know, you, you've got all these stressors outside in your life, right? Especially when you're 40, you know, you've got professional, you could have, um, you know, family stuff, whether that's a spouse, children, you just have a lot more stress and responsibility than you had probably when you were 20. So you have to be cognizant of that. And I think when you frame it in that way, then people are like, oh, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Because like the stress bucket is what it is. You can make it a little bit bigger. You can be smarter about how you manage it, you know, with training, with recovery, sleep, things like that. But, you know, at the same time, you just can't outpace physiology. So that's what I was trying to, to kind of get people in the mindset of there. Like, just be smarter, you know, like it's okay to be a total idiot when you're 20 and try and max out every day for a week. Cause that's what, cause you can, you know, yeah, because you're a teenager or you're 20 something, you can do that. But when you're 40, probably on the second or third day, you're going to be broken. So that's kind of what I was trying to get across there. Yeah. It's amazing when clients get a little bit of perspective, especially from uh, the coach or the expert, how it can definitely create that mind shift that all of a sudden get both on the same page, which is great. Um, next one for you here, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, this is such an important piece. And it's something that I have done my best to live by. I think human nature is always to regress to the mean or get comfortable with like homeostasis. You know, our body likes kind of that comfort zone, but you know, you really don't grow. You really don't change or you don't evolve until you push yourself outside of that comfort zone. Like training is such a great analogy here, right? Because, yeah, you know, if you're constantly comfortable all the time, like, well, that's great, but you're not probably getting fitter. You're probably not getting stronger. Whereas, you know, if you're training hard in the gym, you know, it's those last couple reps, right? Or it's that touching that weight that you've never touched before. Or if you're into the endurance sports, it's it's going a little bit further at a little bit faster pace than you've ever done before. Those are the things that allow you to grow and expand. And it's hard because it is uncomfortable. But if you start to understand that that uncomfortability is a sign of growth, then it changes your mindset. And I think that's such a critical piece of the puzzle. If you just get focused on the discomfort itself, then you're like, yeah, this this sucks. Like, like why am I doing this? But if you get more focused on the discomfort, not just the discomfort, but the underlying or the resulting outcome that will come with it, 
then it gets a little bit easier to put yourself in that position. And it's just, it's one of those things that carries over beyond training, right? Whether it's your business, whether it's your professional life, your personal life, your relationships, like get comfortable being uncomfortable because it's a sure tell sign that you are growing and evolving as a human being. Yeah, it's amazing again how yeah, on that physical and mental and all the aspects, it's uh, it holds true in all those different domains. Um, that's terrific. And last one here for you is I'm not sure if I'm getting this one right, but not laughing enough yeah. as we get older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, look, think about think, I, and maybe I, I'm kind of a goofy guy. Like if you get to know me, lighthearted, but man, I just remember being like a kid and being a teenager and just laughing all the time. Like to the point where like you look at somebody and you can tell they're going to laugh and that makes you laugh. Like, I'm not saying you have to be like that every day, but I think natural human tendencies, you know, as we get older, we just don't laugh as much. We don't find as much joy in life. And don't get me wrong. It's harder, right? Like life is more serious and there's more responsibility. But I mean, one of the best things for me was when we had, when I had my kids, it's like, they're a constant reminder that, you know, life should be fun. It should be enjoyable. And so they were just like this great reminder to me of, look, Things should be enjoyable. They should be fun. Um, Are there stressful times? Yes. Are there hard times? Yes. But, you know, like if you put the right people around you, you should be laughing a lot more. So that's something that, you know, I want in not just my home life, but I want that at my work life as well. Like I've really tried tried to craft a team that uh, people that number one, get along well, that I enjoy being around. Like I always ask myself, would I hang out with this person if they didn't work at IFAST, you know? So that's something I think that's really important because then you can kind of have those open relationships, but you're going to laugh, you're going to have a good time. And then that's ultimately what you want, right? Like, especially as a business owner, I don't want anybody to show up to IFAST and think, oh man, I got to go to work today. I want them to be like, no, I'm excited. I get to go to work today. It's a fun environment. We get better. We enjoy ourselves. So I think it's one of those things where you just kind of have to, you have to stay on yourself because it's easy to fall back in the kind of serious mode. But if you're around the right people and you're just enjoying life, man, you should try and laugh more. I think everybody everybody feels better when they're happy, they're laughing, and they're enjoying life. Yeah, it's definitely one of those ones that can creep up on on folks with the, you know, if they're feeling fatigued or low mood or whatnot, then they, go, they look back at the last sort of week or two or three and realize, just as you mentioned, all of a sudden not laughing at work or not uh, – not enjoying things as much. So it's definitely a great, great piece of advice. And obviously won't go through all the rest of that 37. So people can check out your podcast <laughs> to, uh, to do that. There was um, a lot there. Yeah, for sure. Um, shifting gears here, Mike, I want to respect your time as well here a little bit on the personal side, always curious about what leaders in different fields are reading at the moment. So, you know, what books are on your bookshelf right now? Yeah. So I'll give you a couple that I've been going through. Um, I tend to kind of serial batch my reading. And what I mean by that is I, I kind of group like-minded topics or authors. So I was reading a bunch of uh, Michael Hyatt stuff. Um, I'm looking at, he's got this cool planner that I started with, like a day planner and mm-hmm. loved that. So then Pat Rigsby, who's uh, kind of like my business advisor coach was like, oh, if you like that, you should check out this book. So then he's got a book called Living Forward, which is all about like creating a life plan and Regardless of what you think about it, like, you know, there's tons of books out there on the topic. I've done things like this before. I just liked his model and his approach to it. So I went through that book. Absolutely loved it. I would say if you're going to read books like that, the real key is in actually doing what they ask you to do. So you can't read the book and then not not, not create the last plan and be like, oh, that book's – yeah, you got to execute. You can't be like, oh, that book sucks. Well, no, you just didn't do the work. So uh, that was a really good one. I enjoyed that. Um, and then I got a book from Bill Hartman that he had actually gifted me. I think it was called the 50th rule. Um, so it's really interesting. I'm a huge Robert Greene fan. Um, I don't know if you know who he is, but yep. Robert Greene wrote, uh, mastery, the 48 laws of power. He wrote all these amazing tech. They really they're like textbooks, but this is about, um, basically 50 cent, the rapper, him and Robert Greene kind of co-authored this and it's like these lessons that 50 basically learned on the street 
as a drug hustler growing up or as he came up in the music industry. It's like all these like life lessons he learned on a very small level early in life that he then took and applied as he came up in the music business. That's and terrific. Uh, it's really cool. Like I, I like hip hop anyways. And Robert Greene is probably one of my top three authors of all time. Just cause he's brilliant at what he does. So it's just a really, really cool book. If you either like Robert Greene or 50 Cent, it's a great read. <laughs> if you like them both, it's a, it's a, it's a huge win because it's just really well written. I mean, authors like that have basically spoiled me from reading like poorly written books at this point because if it's not engaging if there's not stories if it's not like multi-layered and how they introduce the material to you i'm going to struggle with it but those two are really good living forward by michael hyatt and i think it's the 50th rule or something like that by robert green and 50 cent that's fantastic definitely uh jot those down and that dovetails actually into my next question i know you're a music guy and a coffee guy um you know what's on your pre-workout pre-game amp up playlist Oh, man. So it really depends on the day. First off, I'm a two cup of coffee a day guy, you know, a little neuro coffee first thing in the morning. Nice, Shout out nice. to my cell. Yeah, love that. Um, so I have that first thing and then generally uh, an Americano before I work out. So I've been loving the, the espresso lately. But when it comes to like workout music, I'm still – I'm still a little bit stuck. I think like uh, those neural pathways are really deep in my brain. Like I still like Metallica, Pantera. I still like like a 50 Cent or a DMX, like harder rap music. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work out like that when you're training at the gym and there's other people there. Uh, they may not Definitely. appreciate the same music. So sometimes Jay Chung, my morning coach, has like Britney Spears radio on. So you got to adapt, I try right? Not <laughs> I try absolutely. I try and adapt and evolve, and at, at least if I can get it to like house music or something like that, as long as it's upbeat, you know, I'm generally going to be okay with it. But if I got to push some weights, a little bit of like that '90s, early 2000s metal, that kind of works for me. Awesome, awesome, Mike. Well, listen. Um, last question for you here: um, If you could go back and give yourself advice, think of yourself as the young 20 year old starting out in the strength game. Knowing what you know now, what what would that be? Yeah, you know, this is similar to uh, the big question that I use on my podcast. And, and it, so, of course, I've never been asked the direct question on the, my podcast, but people have asked me, you know, like in person, like, oh, big question time for you. So <laughs> what I what I always tell people, and, and I'll give you a little bit of backstory here. For sure. When I was coming out of my master's program, I was 100% convinced I wanted to work in strength and conditioning. And so I had other job opportunities come up at like big fitness facilities, boxes. And I was just like, you know, this isn't my thing. So for literally like six months, I mean, I moved back in with my parents, my, my girlfriend and I, now wife, uh, we were living together. I moved in with my parents. She moved in with her parents. I basically substitute taught for six months to like make ends meet. Um, because I was so dead set that I was going to take a strength and conditioning job. And so finally, when I, when I ended up taking my first job, it wasn't in strength and conditioning, but I was like, look, I mean, I've been sitting on the sidelines here six months. I got no leads. I'm going to take this position. And I kid you not a week later, Richard Howell, who is, he was at the time, he was the assistant strength coach for the Colts. Now I believe he's the head strength coach calls me and he offers me an internship unpaid for six months. And man, like the year before, this was my thing. I was like, I can't, I, I would absolutely drop everything to do this right now. Didn't happen. And so now here I am a year later, perspective has obviously changed. And I'm just like, Rich, man, I would love to take this, but I just can't. I can't do six months unpaid. And so now looking back, this is the exact advice I give to my interns now. Like think long term, right? Like if one extra internship will get you to where you're going faster or get you the experience that you need or open your network, figure it out, man. Like if I would have been more creative at the time, I could have, I don't know, taken out a loan or maybe I could have asked my parents for money. I was like 24, super stubborn at the time. So I wasn't going to do that, but you know, I would have found a creative way to make it work. Right. So that's the advice I would go back and don't get me wrong. I love where I'm at. I have crafted and created like the perfect lifestyle and the perfect business for who I am and, and 
kind of the, the way I want to live. But I always do think like, what if I took that different path? So I always tell young up and coming kids, if you're listening to this, like, just think long term, right? Anything, you can do anything for three to six months, right? Even if it's eating ramen noodles, sleeping on your best friend's couch or on their floor in a sleeping bag, like figure it out. Because ultimately, if you make those sacrifices now, they're going to get you to wherever you want to go faster down the line. That's fantastic. Yeah, definitely great advice. Big picture is is, is definitely um, so so key. And Mike, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic work? Yeah, the best place is just Robertson Training Systems dot com. Uh, there you can find articles, podcasts, short training videos. I mean, that's basically the hub for everything that I do online. So you know. Be sure to check that out. There's just so much free content. Like, yeah, I've got paid stuff and online coaching and all that, but you can hang out on my site for probably days and just consume free stuff, whether it's written, video, audio. There's tons of free stuff there. I'm just super passionate about making our industry a little bit better place. So if you want to take your skills to the next level, just go check it out. I guarantee there's something on there that can help make you a better coach. Fantastic. We'll definitely include the links.